This hearing of the uh, Subcommittee on the Constitution, Civil Rights, and Civil Liberties will come to order. Uh, I will first recognize myself for an opening statement. Today's hearing examines the current status of the faith-based and community partnerships, and particularly the report of the President's Advisory Council. Although I was gratified by the President's decision to take a fresh look at this important but difficult issue, and was especially appreciative of the outstanding work done by, members, by the members of the Advisory Council, I, like many of my colleagues, remain frustrated by the glacial pace of reforms. Today's hearing is timely. Just yesterday, the administration finally issued its revision of Executive Order 13279, setting out, quote, fundamental principles and policymaking criteria for partnerships with faith-based and other neighborhood organizations, close quote. <coughs> it has been long anticipated, and it contains some very important reforms. I'm glad that we have with us this distinguished panel, which I hope will be able to provide the subcommittee with their thoughts on the new executive order. Difficult issues remain. What has been especially frustrating since President Bush first launched the initiative is that so many of the problems that the initiative sought to address simply never existed in the first place. I don't think any member of Congress or indeed anyone involved in the delivery of social services from the neighborhood level on up minimizes the critical contributions made by people of faith and by social service providers that have a religious affiliation. Nor is there any question that these organizations have long worked with government and administered publicly funded programs in ways that have done a great deal of good for the communities we represent and for the nation as a whole. And it is also without question that these partnerships existed and thrived long before the faith-based and community initiative. Despite some grandiose if specious claims to the contrary, these organizations were not barred from receiving public funding simply because of a religious affiliation or because they had a religious name in their title. Every member of this committee has no doubt worked with many religiously affiliated organizations in their districts and has helped get funding for such organizations to deliver all manner of social services, senior housing, and the like. But if the faith-based and community initiative was a solution in search of a problem, it brought with it a host of real problems, many of which pose a real threat to the religious liberties of program participants and employees. Promises that have been made about providing participants with secular or other religiously appropriate alternatives have gone unfulfilled. Without these alternatives, the patina of respect for the religious rights of those most in need not to mention the legal pretense of constitutionality, is stripped away. Furthermore, the promise that this initiative would mobilize the armies of compassion has been broken precisely because some of the initiative's most vocal supporters have also been the first to cut off that army's supply lines by slashing pro uh, funding for those very programs. As David Kuo, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, the Deputy Director of the White House Office of Faith-Based and Community Initiatives in the Bush administration wrote, quote, the achievements of the Bush faith-based faith initiative are a whisper of what was promised. Irony of ironies, it leaves the faith-based initiative specifically and compassionate conservatism in general at precisely the place Governor, Bu Governor Bush pledged it would not go. It has done the work of praising and informing, but it has not been given the resources to change lives. In short, like the hurting charities it is trying to help, the initiative has been forced to, quote, make bricks without straw, close quote, and that's the end of the quote from Mr. Quo. It is no secret that I have been disappointed with this administration's handling of these difficult issues, not to mention with the previous administration's handling of these difficult issues. On the matter of ending employment discrimination in federally funded programs, about which the President was so eloquent in 2008, we have heard nothing. We haven't even been able to find out, for example, whether the Office of Legal Counsel memo asserting that the Religious Freedom Restoration Act creates a free exercise right to discriminate in employment in federally funded programs is under review, much less what might be done with it. I realize that the employment issue is not within the Advisory Commission's mandate, but it is still of pressing importance to the members of this committee. I regret the administration was unable to provide a witness today <coughs> who might be able to answer our questions about the executive order and about the administration's progress on related issues. Nonetheless, I am pleased to welcome our panel today, and I look forward to their testimony. They are certainly no strangers to this committee, and I have over the years had the privilege of working with each of them on many projects, starting with RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which we passed the year I first joined this House a while ago. I look forward to their testimony, and I yield back the balance of my time. The Chair now recognizes the distinguished ranking member for an opening statement. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. President George W. Bush began a faith-based initiative designed to grant faith-based organizations equal access to competitions for the administration of federal social service programs. Part of the effort resulted in a legal memo from the White House Office of Legal Counsel issued on June 29, 2007. That memo protects the right of faith-based organizations to take part in such programs while staffing their organizations on a religious basis, allowing them to preserve their religious character. The memo remains in force today. Under a properly implemented faith-based program, programs must be administered to beneficiaries without regard to religion. But the organizations doing the administering can themselves be religious, and that is in accordance with settled law. Nothing in the Civil Rights Act of 1964 says a religious organization loses its right to staff on a religious basis when it uses federal funds. Indeed, when it enacted Title VII in 1964, Congress was well aware that religious institutions of higher education that staffed on a religious basis were receiving federally funded grants and student aid. And under the GI Bill, established in 1944, military veterans were able to attend religious colleges and universities of their choice then the tuition costs were either offset or fully covered through a federal voucher payment sent to the selected school. So Congress was well aware when it enacted religious exemptions in Title VII that federal <coughs> funds would be going to religious organizations that made staffing decisions based upon religion. Members of faith-based organizations should enjoy the same rights to associate with others who share their unique vision that other non-religious groups enjoy. To deny them the same right would be to discriminate against people on the basis that they are religious than have a religious rather than purely secular way of looking at the world. For example, Planned Parenthood may refuse to hire those who don't share its views on abortion, but equal treatment requires that churches, mosques, and synagogues to have the same right to staff their organization with like-minded individuals. Earlier this year, the Government Accountability Office issued a report finding that between 2002 and 2009, Planned Parenthood received $657 million in taxpayer dollars while it continued to staff its organization with like-minded people. If Planned Parenthood can receive federal funds and continue to staff based upon ideological views regarding abortion, and if religion is to be treated equally, religious organization should also retain their ability to staff on a religious basis when they receive federal funds. If churches cannot continue to hire and staff on a religious basis, they no longer remain churches while joining federal social service efforts. Indeed, insofar as the courts have had to determine whether or not an organization is a church for tax purposes, it is looked to whether it is a coherent group of individuals and families that join together to accomplish the religious purposes of mutually held beliefs. If churches, as churches, are to be invited to join federal social service efforts, their ability to remain, or to remain a, con a coherent group of individuals that join together to accomplish the religious purposes of mutually held beliefs must be protected. President Clinton recognized that many years ago when he signed into law four congressional acts that explicitly allow religious organizations to retain their right to staff on a religious basis when they receive federal funds. These laws are the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Act, the Community Services Block Grant Act of 1998, the Welfare Reform Act of 1996, and the Community Renewal Tax Relief Act of 2000. Even the Washington Post recognizes that protecting the staffing rights of religious organizations is not radical. In a May 2003 editorial, the Post stated the House of Representatives passed a bill last week that would allow faith-based organizations to provide federally funded training to discriminate in the hiring on the basis of religion. The change in the Workforce Investment Act is not radical. Religious groups, including many religious universities that receive federal money, are generally exempt from federal laws against religious discrimination in hiring. And the 1996 Welfare Reform Bill allowed faith-based groups access to us, other social service funds without their forfeiting this exemptions. 
protections that preserve a religious organization's right to remain religious while neutrally administering federal social services have long been accepted on a bipartisan basis. And so it is no surprise to me that the current administration has not denied them. Thank you. Thank you. I now recognize the distinguished uh, chairman of the uh, full committee for an opening statement. I just said no, I was kidding. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to make a comment or two. I, I have never said no before, so I, I just wanted to see what it would, how you'd react to it. And you didn't disappoint me. Uh, this is a, a very timely hearing. Uh, the executive order comes out yesterday, and we have the hearing. Uh, whose uh, brilliant foresight do we give credit to that? Uh, I, I don't uh, entirely discount the possibility that the timing of the hearing may have had some effect on the timing of the issuance of the executive order. The gentleman oh. will yield. I concede that point. <laughs> <laughs> Well, interesting question. Now, I, I'm so glad that our former chairman, Jim Sensenbrenner, is here for this important hearing. And I'm not surprised that, uh, that he believes that the previous administration's position that religious organizations are exempt from the commitment to equal opportunity in federally funded employment and that they can discriminate based on religion. That doesn't surprise me at all. Uh, but what does surprise me is that uh, here the day after an executive order is is issued, we cannot get a representative from the present administration to attend the hearing. And so I would like to get the approval of the chair and the ranking member and our subcommittee chairman on crime, Bobby Scott, uh, to be able to communicate uh, to the White House that they ought to get someone over here right away before the lame duck session ends. Uh, Will the gentleman yield again? I, with pleasure. Uh, I would be happy to co-sign a letter and will await your co-signature of letters after January 3rd when we're trying to get administration witnesses over here. <laughs> well, I, I, I try to interpret that as that after uh, January 5th, my, my weight in letters of this kind will become more important, not less important. So I, I thank you for joining us. Uh, the, the whole idea uh, that we can hold this hearing after knowing and receiving information that the president has explicitly sought from the council members an agreement not to deal with employment discrimination uh, needs to be explained further. And uh, there are ways that we can get people from the White House over here. And I, I don't think that in the 21st century uh, and in the wake of uh, this administration, that we need to wait to see uh, what more uh, reporting and findings and recommendations come down. Uh, I'd like to know now, while you're the chairman and, and I'm the chairman, and, and the way the, the, the 111th is proceeding we may have plenty of time for such a hearing. And so I, I'm glad that I've, I've gotten your 
uh, agreement and approval uh, to, to take such actions. Uh, this, this is no way for us uh, to try to do business. And uh, so I am, I am impressed that we have not one but two members uh, of the uh, council with us today. Uh, Reverend Lynn and uh, Professor Rogers, we, we welcome you because this isn't a matter of, uh, of uh, one branch of government uh, drawing a veil over a, a subject of this immediate importance and uh, we have to guess or try to figure out what and why and when something further is coming. The president explicitly campaigned and has made many remarks about this uh, not only as a candidate, but as a senator. And uh, we don't propose to wait any longer. And I, I look forward to uh, your comments and participation in the hearing. Thank you, Chairman Nadler. Thank you. And I now recognize the distinguished gentleman from Virginia for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank you for convening this important hearing, as well as thanking our witnesses for being with us today. And I'd like to commend the members of the Advisory Council on Faith-Based and Neighborhood uh, Partnerships and its members of the Council's task force for their work. Uh, their recommendations find common ground on which to lay a foundation for strengthening the constitutional and legal partnerships between the government and non-governmental social service providers as well as provide clarity and transparency in the provision of these services while all the time protecting our nation's commitment to religious freedom. Unfortunately, their work is far from done. The most egregious aspect of the so-called faith-based initiative, the right of religious social service providers to discriminate in employment with government funds, uh, remains unresolved. One of the founding principles of our great nation was the freedom to worship and not worship as one chooses. Faith plays a central role in the lives of many Americans, and our communities benefit from the countless acts of justice and mercy that faith inspires people to commit. Faith-based organizations are often on the front lines of meeting challenges like homelessness, youth violence, and other social programs. At the same time, the history of our nation and its First Amendment protections do not and should not allow public funds to be used to proselytize or discriminate. In the 1960s, uh, several civil rights acts were passed in, uh, in order to end the nation's sorry history of racial bigotry. Uh, since that time, it has been illegal to discriminate in employment against protected classes and make job discriminations based on race or religion. And I mentioned protected classes and I'd like to respond to the gentleman from Wisconsin, the ranking member from Wisconsin who mentioned the Planned Parenthood example that is frequently used. A uh, position on abortion is not a protected class. There is a difference between Planned Parenthood hiring people based on their position on some social issue as opposed to we don't hire blacks or we don't hire Jews. Race and religion are protected classes and that is what is protected in our civil rights laws. Uh, one exemption exists for religious organizations but that uh, uh, discrimination is allowed in the context of a religious organization using its own money. However, however long before that, the country recognized uh, the disgusting practice of discrimination in employment while using federal funds. Almost 70 years, almost 70 years ago, 1941, President Franklin Roosevelt issued an executive order prohibiting discrimination by all defense contractors. In other words, that the U.S. government would said that if even if you can build a cheaper and better rifle, we're not going to buy it from you if you discriminate in, in your employment. 1965, President Johnson expanded that policy in an executive order, banning discrimination in all government contracts. Uh, no discrimination with federal, federal funds has been the policy of this government for decades, at least until the so-called faith-based initiative. Under traditional laws, many religious organizations have been sponsoring federally funded social pro service programs for over a century. Until recently, they were funded like all other private organizations are funded. They had to use the funds for the purpose for which they were appropriated. They were prohibited from using taxpayers' money to, to advance their religious beliefs, and they were subject to laws that prohibit discrimination in employment. Let's be clear, religious organizations could still discriminate in positions paid for with their own money, just not those paid for with federal funds. And many religiously affiliated organizations, such as Catholic Charities, 
Lutheran Services of America. Uh, Jewish Social Services have been receiving funds, millions and even billions of dollars, for decades. Incredibly, the idea of charitable choice and President Bush's so-called faith-based initiative uh, came about because some people insist on discriminating in employment and therefore were barred from federal contracts. They now believe that the prohibition against discrimination with federal funds constituted a barrier that needed to be removed. Unfortunately, the faith-based initiative specifically removed that so-called barrier, and as a result, religiously sponsored organizations, religious sponsors of federally funded programs are now allowed to discriminate in employment with federal dollars on the basis of religion. That means that a person applying for a job, paid for with federal money, can, can be uh, ineligible for consideration for that job solely based on religion. And if this bigotry based on religion is tolerated, racial and sexual discrimination disguised as religious discrimination certainly follows. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that if you get a pass on religion, it will be impossible to, to enforce non-discrimination laws based on race. Uh, Dr. King once said that 11 o'clock on Sunday was the most segregated hour of America, and that's still true today. And so if you discriminate based on religion, based on which church you go to, that has racial implications. Religious discrimination is also a, pro a proxy for dis discrimination based on, on sex, uh, based on um, uh, things like single motherhood, uh, divorce, or premarital sex. Uh, it is shocking that we'd even be having a discussion about whether or not civil rights practices ought to apply to programs run with federal dollars. For decades, um, when funds were raised from all taxpayers, it has been and should continue to be illegal for sponsors to reject applicants solely because of their religion. Uh, there's no justification for having a, to re restoring a practice where you can tell job applicants that we don't hire your kind. The so-called faith-based initiative pre represented a profound change in policy since 1965 if an employer had a problem hiring the best qualified applicant uh, because of discrimination based on race or religion. That employer had a problem because the weight of the federal government was behind the victim of discrimination. But with the faith-based initiative, we shifted the weight of the federal government to support from supporting the victim to supporting the employer's right to discriminate. This is a profound change in civil rights protection. And if we don't enforce discrimination laws in federal contracts in secular programs, where is our moral authority to tell a private employer who may be devoutly religious for what he can and can't do with his own private money? A policy of religious discrimination in employment is wrong in the private sector and it is certainly wrong with federal funds. Uh, we need to, uh, the, unfortunately, the executive order uh, did not address the, this profound issue. It failed to address the employment issue. And, uh, and we're disappointed that um, they failed to present a witness so we could inquire why that was, um, why that was done. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I'd like to uh, insert to the record the rest of my uh, uh, statement. Uh, Without objection. But I look forward to the testimony of the witnesses, uh, particularly in light of the um, question that we'll have on uh, employment discrimination. And I will yield to the uh, chairman of the committee. Uh, thank you. I merely want to associate myself uh, with an excellent statement. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. That objection, all members, will have five legislative days to submit a opening statements for inclusion in the record. That objection, the chair will be authorized to declare a recess of the hearing, which we will do in the event of votes on the floor, but only in such an event. We'll now turn to our panel of witnesses. As we ask questions of our witnesses, the chair will recognize members in the order of their seniority and in the or usual uh, order, uh, usual procedure of this committee. Uh, I'll now introduce the witnesses, Melissa Rogers, serves as the director of the Wake Forest University School of Divinity Center for Religion and Public Affairs, and as a non-resident senior fellow at the governance program of the Brookings Institution. In 2009, President Barack Obama appointed her to his advisory council on faith-based and neighborhood partnerships. There, she chaired the task force on the reform of the Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships, whose recommendations we will be discussing today. Professor Rogers previously served as the executive director of the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life. Prior to her leadership at the Pew Forum, Professor Rogers served as general counsel of the Baptist Joint Committee on Religious Liberty based in Washington, D.C. She earned her B.A. from Baylor University and her J.D. from the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Douglas Laycock is a professor of law and of religious studies at the University of Virginia. 
He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a vice president of the American Law Institute. Before joining UVA's faculty in 2010, Professor Laycock served as the Yale Commissar Collegiate Professor of Law at the University of Michigan Law School. Prior to that, he taught for 25 years at the University of Texas and for five years at the University of Chicago. Professor Laycock earned his BA from Michigan State University and his JD from the, from the University of Chicago Law School. Reverend Barry Lynn is an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ and has served as the Executive Director of Americans United for Separation of Church and State since 1992. Along with Professor Rogers, he, serves on, he served on the task force on the reform of the Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. Reverend Lynn began his career working at the National Office of the United Church of Christ, including a two-year stint as legislative counsel for the Church's Office of Church and Society in Washington. From 1984 to 1991, he was legislative counsel for the Washington Office of the American Civil Liberties Union. Reverend Lynn earned his law degree from Georgetown University Law Center and received his theology degree from Boston University School of Theology in 1973. I'm pleased to welcome all of you. Your written statements in their entirety will be made part of the record. I would ask you to summarize your testimony in five minutes or less. To help you stay within that time, there's a timing light at your table. You've all testified here before. You know what the light means. Uh, when one minute remains, the light will switch from green to yellow and then red when the time is up. Before we begin, it's customary for the committee to swear in its witnesses. If you would please stand and raise your right hands to take the oath. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Let the record reflect that the witness is answered in the affirmative. You may be seated. Uh, thank you very much. I'll now recognize uh, Professor Rogers. Can you use your mic and speak into it? A little closer to the mic. Pull it a little closer. That's that better? better. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chairman Nadler, and uh, thanks also to Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, Chairman Conyers, Representative Scott, Representative Watt, and the other members of the subcommittee. Uh, I appreciate the invitation to be here with you today, and I appreciate your interest in the work of the Advisory Council, and I'm also grateful for our partnership in years past on free exercise matters like the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. It's been wonderful to work with you. Uh, let me say that I don't speak today for the full Advisory Council or any of the organizations with which I am affiliated. But I do speak as one who's long worked on issues related to partnerships between the government and nonprofits, both religious and secular. I also speak as a lifelong Baptist, and I am, as a Baptist, I believe that the mandates to care for our neighbors and to provide religious freedom for all people are not only legal, policy, and ethical matters, they are also scriptural imp imperatives for me. In March, the Advisory Council urged President Obama to take a wide range of actions to strengthen the constitutional and legal footing of the partnerships that it forms with nonprofits to serve people in need. And those involved in the council process have some serious differences on church-state matters, yet through some painstaking and long periods of work, we were able to reach consensus on some key recommendations. As you've already noted, yesterday President Obama signed an executive order that implemented many of these recommendations. This order is a major step forward in our efforts to create more clarity, transparency, accountability, and constant constitutional compliance in these partnerships. Let me just quickly mention, if I could, six of the changes the executive order makes. First, the new order says that beneficiaries have the right to an alternative provider if they object to the, their provider's religious character. And the beneficiaries have to receive written notice of this and other rights at the outset. Second, the new order clarifies some fuzzy rules about uses of direct government aid making it clear that such aid can't be used for explicitly religious activities, meaning activities that contain overt religious content like uh, prayer, worship, and proselytizing. The new order also directs a, uh, an interagency working group to provide re regulations and guidance on the need to cleanly separate any privately funded religious activities from programs that are subsidized by direct government aid. At the same time, the order makes it clear that religious providers can retain a religious name and religious symbols in their building. Third, the order says government-funded programs have to be monitored to ensure that church-state rules and other rules are being followed. But the government must do so in ways that don't create excessive church-state entanglement. Fourth, the new 
executive order says that the government must post things like grant and guidance documents on the web, as well as lists of nonprofits that receive federal social service funds. Fifth, the order says that decisions about awards of federal social service funds must be free of even the appearance of political interference and that those decisions have to be made on the basis of merit and not on religious affiliation or lack thereof. And six, as I've already mentioned, uh, the order uh, creates the f what I think is the first interagency working group to create uniform policies around these and other issues. Now, the new order doesn't call for churches to form separate corporations if they wish to receive gov direct government aid, and that's a change that 13 council members, including me, advocated as a way of insulating churches from government oversight. Also, as you've already noted in your remarks, the uh, one important issue, the employment issue, was put outside the council's charge. But the order adopts key consensus recommendations of the council, and I believe it's a great achievement, not only because it does so much to bring these efforts into line with religious liberty principles, but also because it does so with the backing of people who have been divided over these issues for a very long time. As you know, about 15 years ago, some controversial policies started popping up in this area, and we've been fighting ever since. But now we've, we've got some common ground policies, not on everything, but on some important matters, and that's an important advance. As you know, in my written testimony, I've addressed the issue of religion-based decision-making by faith-based groups and government-funded jobs. As I've already noted, the White House instructed the council not to address this issue, and it is said that it is dealing with the issue through a separate process, one that's not connected to the council process. It's critical to note that this debate about government funded is, is about government funded jobs, not privately funded jobs. I fully support the ability of all religious organizations to make decisions on the basis of religion regarding jobs that they fund themselves. My Baptist church, of course, should be able to call a Baptist preacher, and a synagogue, of course, should be able to call a rabbi. But subsidizing jobs with government money changes the calculus. We have a long-standing tradition, something that's already been mentioned, of equal, equal opportunity in federally funded employment, and I believe that's a tradition that we should continue. In my view, it's wrong to allow any religious group, including my own, to place a religious test on a job that's funded by a government grant. Because current rules and policies permit this in some instances, I believe this matter must be addressed. So I want to thank you for the opportunity to be with you, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you, uh, Professor Laycock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Microphone, you need to pull it down. Nope. I think you were better off a moment ago, but maybe not close enough to the mic. Is the light on? The green light. There we go. Well, it was on, but it wasn't on brightly enough. <laughs> it turns out to be the answer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's good to be back before this uh, committee. Let me begin by saying that I'm a firm supporter of separation of church and state. But separation is not an end uh, in itself. It has an underlying purpose. Separation is not about aesthetics or mechanics uh, for their own sake. It is not about taking pictures off the walls or making sure that no government dollar ever touches anything religious. It is far more important than that. The purpose of separation of church and state is, is to separate the religious choices and commitments of the American people uh, from the overriding power and influence of government. Uh, to ensure that Americans and their voluntary associations can act on their faith or on their lack of faith uh, without government interfering and trying to persuade them or coerce them to change their faith commitments or the way they carry out those faith commitments. So how do we provide that protection in the context of charitable choice? As several of the committee members mentioned, government has used grants and contracts of the private sector for a very long time. It has used both religious and secular providers for a very long time. But before the first charitable choice legislation in 1996, there was very little in the way of visible rules uh, to protect religious liberty. Some government officials liked religious providers and some didn't, and many of them felt free to act on those preferences, to discriminate in favor of religion or against religion. Um, the charitable choice provisions of the Welfare Reform Act enacted clear religious liberty principles for the first time. I can't speak to what the political motivations of the sponsors were, but the substance of that act 
uh, stated some very important religious principles, uh, religious liberty principles. No discrimination between religious and secular providers. No surrender of religious identity for the religious providers. No discrimination on the base of religion against the recipients of the services. No coercion to participate in religious activities. Uh, the guarantee of an alternative secular provider to any recipient who asked for one. Uh, audit of the government money only as long as it was segregated from the religious providers money. Uh, no use of government funds to support the religious activities. Much of that was being written down uh, for the first time. The Bush administration executive orders that expanded these programs were much less explicit about many of those protections. Some of them were simply omitted. President Obama's executive order yesterday, as Professor Rogers just summarized, makes the rules explicit for all programs, and it creates a task force to work on further implementation issues, which is where the real uh, difficult problems uh, often occur. And that leaves employment as the principal disputed issue. Um, the 1996 uh, legislation says, the President's Advisory Council says, the President's Executive Order says, religious organizations with government grants and contracts uh, need not surrender their religious identity. Nothing, nothing is more important to religious identity than the ability to hire employees who actually support the religious mission and will faithfully execute it. And if you want to take that away, you are saying the groups, that, the religious groups who participate in these programs have to, have to secularize themselves in a very dramatic way. It uses the coercive power of the purse uh, to force religious social service providers to become much more secular than they were. Now, we have a long-standing commitment in this country against invidious discrimination. Mr. Scott called it bigotry, and that is right. It's against the irrational exclusion of racial and religious minorities and of people on the basis of sex in contexts where those criteria are simply not relevant. Um, if you're a religious organization, religious affiliation is relevant. It is not about bigotry. It is not about irrational exclusion. It is about the First Amendment. It is about assembling a group of like-minded people uh, in pursuit of a common uh, religious mission and a common uh, activity. Um, religion is a protected class, but it was never intended uh, to uh, protect, re uh, to, to, to make religion irrelevant in religious context. That doesn't protect religion, doesn't protect religious minorities. Uh, it forces uh, any religious organization, majority or minority, that participates in these programs uh, to abandon an essential part of its mission. The government says, here's a large pot of money. If you run good programs, you can win grants, you can expand your operation, you can help more people in need. But if and only if you surrender your right to hire people who support your mission, that violates the fundamental purpose of separation of church and state. It uses the power of the purse to coerce religious organizations to become less religious and more secular, and that would be uh, a fundamental policy mistake. This committee should not uh, try to force the administration into doing that. Um, <clears throat> One reason that separationists have historically opposed uh, government funding of religious organizations is the fear that uh, regulation and conditions will come with the money and the religious organization will be corrupted. Uh, there is no clearer example of that sort of corruption uh, than forbidding these organizations to hire people who actually support their mission. I think the administration's failure to act on the hiring issue is well advised. I thank the witness, uh, Reverend Lynn. The single most important action that remains is to undo President Bush's executive orders and regulations that permit a religious entity that receives a government grant or contract to make hiring decisions for the very programs that are federally funded on the basis of religion. This is sometimes referred to as preferential hiring, but it is more accurately labeled simply as discrimination, and it is ethically and legally wrong. President Obama knew this when he spoke as a candidate in 2008 and affirmed that you can't use grant money to discriminate against the people you hire on the basis of their religion. 
And I'd say the American people know it as well, and that's why 73% of Americans polled that same year said that a religious group that wanted to engage in discriminatory hiring should not get tax dollars at all. It is terribly wrong to reject the best qualified person for a secular job at a faith-based institution because he or she does not pass a religious litmus test. In my experience, a Baptist does not label out, uh, ladle out rice in a soup kitchen any differently than does a Bap B Buddhist. A Catholic does not tuck in the sheets at a homeless shelter in a way that differs from how it would be done by a Quaker. Some who lead religious organizations wouldn't call what they want to do unethical or illegal or even wrong. They simply say they are more comfortable working with people who believe as they do, people like themselves. Many of us have heard all that before. We heard it about race. We heard it about gender. But level of comfort is not a constitutionally permissible basis for selecting what job another person can seek. Discriminatory hiring has very real consequences. Saeed Mohammed Ali, a refugee from Iraq, had volunteered for six months at the charity World Relief up in Seattle. A co-worker suggested he apply for a paid position as an Arabic-speaking caseworker. Just days later, he was called and told not to bother applying because he was, after all, a Muslim and not a Christian. If World Relief were funded entirely with private dollars, it would be allowed to make such judgments under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. Many of us might not like that, but that is what the law permits. But when a religious entity gets dollars from taxpayers, the taxpayers whose beliefs range from atheism to Zoroastrianism, from A to Z, the calculus quite properly changes. The civil rights framework of our country comes into play, and such discrimination must be legally impermissible. I don't want to impair the religious character of any church or temple or synagogue or charitable group, but the free exercise of religion is not burdened when a group voluntarily accepts government funds knowing that it contains constraints on certain religiously motivated conduct like hiring only your own followers. The First Amendment to the United States Constitution is not an excuse to refuse to play by American rules when you're playing with Americans' dollars. And the rules at the federal level do matter all over this country. A state-funded Methodist Social Service Agency in Georgia felt that it had the right to deny a man named Alan Yorker a job as a psychologist. What had he done? He filled in his job application with the name of his rabbi and his synagogue in the spaces marked pastor and church, and then was told, we don't hire people of your faith. Mr. Yorker filed a lawsuit. It has been settled in his favor. Some members of the President's Advisory Council claim that if we, quote unquote, burden religious providers with hiring rules, they will not accept government funds, and this will reduce their ability to help people in need. This sometimes, to me at least, sounds more like a threat than it does a moral rationale. Indeed, if World Vision, which refuses to hire non-Christians, refused to take the $343 million worth of government grants it receives, there are dozens of other charities, religious and secular, eager to apply for those grants. Most religious charities have always hired the best people they could find to work out their social missions without asking them to swear allegiance to any specific religious creed, and they would continue to do so. Prohibiting discrimination on the basis of religion requires relatively simple action. Congress can do it with a few lines of statute or the president with a short executive order, undoing that wrong initiated less than a decade ago. This is not hard. It is not reform of the health care system. It is not extricating the United States from Afghanistan. It is, Mr. Scott, not rocket science. It is simple justice. Thank you. I thank, uh, I thank you, Reverend Lynn. Uh, we have two votes on the floor. We have four minutes and 28 seconds remaining, but that's congressional time. We'll have a little more time than that. So uh, the, the, uh, there's about five minutes remaining on this vote, five minutes on the next vote. Uh, and then I ask the members of the committee to return as soon as possible after that second vote. And meanwhile, I will declare the hearing in recess.
The uh, hearing will reconvene, and I apologize to everyone for that uh, delay. Hopefully it won't occur again, but it might. Uh, I will begin the uh, questions by recognizing myself for five minutes. Uh, first, uh, for Professor Rogers. Um, you testified that the Supreme Court has never interpreted the Free Exercise Clause to prevent the government from, pla to prevent the government from placing non-discrimination conditions on grants to or contracts with religious organizations including the requirement that providers abide by longstanding commitments to equal opportunity in federally funded jobs. Professor Laycock and the Office of Legal Counsel contend that the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, RIFRA, compels a different result. Congress was very clear that the purpose of RIFRA was to restore the pre-Smith application of, that is, I don't think I have to explain to this audience what Smith was, <laughs> the pre-Smith application of strict scrutiny to free exercise claims. If under the pre-Smith application of strict scrutiny restored by RIFRA, the government could place non-discrimination condition on grants, how is it possible that RIFRA compels a different result? And let me add that many of us have urged the Obama administration to review the OLC opinion on this. When they do so, do you see any grounds for them to uphold that opinion, or should it be revised or withdrawn? Uh, yes, Chairman Nadler, thank you for that question. Um, I believe that <coughs> the opinion, the World Vision opinion that the Department of Justice... You speak closer to Mike. Sure, that the Department of Justice offered should be reconsidered, and in my view it should be withdrawn, because in my view it, it incorrectly interprets the burden prong of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, finding that the... Um, requirement that a non-discrimination provision in the, refer in the uh, actual grant cannot flow uh, or cannot be placed on the recipient because of RIFRA because, and the opinion says that that's a substantial burden, and I just think they got that wrong. Um, you think that's not a substantial burden? I think it's not a substantial burden. It is um, a government grant that uh, applies to, the non-discrimination clause applies to positions that would be within the government program, but it doesn't apply to positions that would be outside the government program and privately funded. So there's certainly a lot of latitude there. And it's something that an organization could uh, take the grant or not take the grant. They're under no duress to take the grant. And if they don't agree with it. And the necessity not to take the grant would not be a substantial burden. Not taking the grant would not be a substantial burden. Yes, I agree with that. So my view is that that opinion incorrectly interpreted the burden analysis. And so I, I do hope that the Department of Justice will reconsider that opinion and, and withdraw that particular opinion. And the first part of my question, which was the, uh, that under the pre-Smith application of, of strict scrutiny restored by RIFRA, uh, it was always assumed at that time that the government could, pla could place non-discrimination conditions on grants how can RIFRA compel a, a, a different result? Um, I don't believe that RIFRA does compel a different result. And uh, Chairman Nadler, you were a leading a member um, and very active in the RIFRA debate. And I think what was true of that coalition that passed RIFRA, which was so broad, is that there were different opinions about matters like these. So we had to say, uh, I think, that these matters would be affected by RIFRA. Well. I, I agree. I, I should say that legislative intent is uh, sometimes – I once lost a lawsuit in the New York State uh, courts on the legislative intent of a statute that I was one of the principal authors of. Uh, <laughs> so you never know. Um, <laughs> Professor Laycock, um, you testified that protecting the right of program beneficiaries by the guarantee of a secular alternative to religious providers is fundamental to these programs. I think that's a direct quote from your testimony. Does that requirement of constitutional dimensions, that is, is it required by the free exercise or establishment clause in your opinion? You know, there's not a Supreme Court case directly in point, but yes, I think the requirement of a secular alternative is of constitutional dimension. Um, the, the government cannot uh, force recipients into a religious alternative as the only alternative available. So you think it is of constitutional? So your answer is yes. My answer is yes. And what are or should be the consequences if we cannot ensure alternatives in that case? Um, <clears throat> well, uh, I mean, the, the premise of that question is ensuring the second alternative is difficult. It's gonna, it, it takes some money and it, and it takes some planning. And 
Um, and, and if you have uh, a beneficiary request a second alternative and doesn't get it, you got a constitutional violation. Well, then what's the remedy for that violation? I don't think it's to shut down the entire program. And I think, the, I think you have to have a remedy focused on that individual. Uh, on, on that well, individual. what would be the remedy? Not to shut down the entire program. Is there a different remedy? I, I mean, but, we are in a, in a situation where uh, obviously funding is tight. It's going to be tighter in the next few years or decades. Um, so what would be the remedy if it is unconstitutional not to have a remedy? Um, well, the, well the, I mean, the, the remedy is for the court to order the agency to fund a secular alternative. Um, and if, if that turns out to be flatly impossible on the ground, then I don't know where we are. But, okay. but, but the remedy is to create the secular alternative. Which, which, yeah, okay, so in other words. And I would think, sir, in, in an individual case, it's always going to be possible. What, what's difficult is to do it in a structural manner so that we can be confident it's always going to be there for any beneficiary who needs it. All right. Now, in effect, you're saying that one solution is to, to concerns about religious discrimination in federally funded jobs is simply to fund a diverse range of employers. Some will discriminate based on religion, some who will not, so that there's an alternative available. Setting aside other possible objections, how do we square this with the consensus position taken, I believe, by everyone in the witness uh, table today, by the Bush administration, by the Advisory Council, and by the new executive order, that the government absolutely should not consider religious affiliation or lack of affiliation when making grants or distributing funds? Doesn't this solution actually require consideration of affiliation and beliefs in order to make sure they have some with and some without? No, I don't. I, I don't believe it does. I think the connection runs the other way. That, 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 if, that, when the government says you have to secularize your hiring in order to be eligible, that is very similar to saying we only consider secular providers. Um, and and I think the logic of these programs is, if you award the grants without regard to religion and on the basis of the merit of the programs, um, the distribution of grants won't be perfectly even, but it will be. But, but how do you, what I, what I don't understand is how do you figure out that some of the groups that you're going to be funding are not going to discriminate so that you have alternatives knowing that some will if you don't ask? And, and, and if it's in, impermissible to ask, what? The premise of the program is you award the grants on the basis of merit and you assume that in the real world, that will result in some kind of a distribution. It's not going to be the same group getting the grant every time. And if it is, then we want to check whether the funding agency is really awarding on the basis of merit or whether... Well, some group may merit. really be meritorious as compared to others. Pardon? It's always possible that some group really is so meritorious that it gets all the grants. It, from. It, 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 it's possible. It's possible. But, I, but I, I think our experience has been that generally you get a distribution. Well, let me ask you one, my last question. With the unavailability of non-discriminating employers or the lack of jobs that those employers change the result, and do prospective employers have to relocate or take lower-paying jobs, or would this violate the principle of alternative employers? Shall you repeat that? Well, I think we've moved from the principle of alternative providers for beneficiaries to alternative employers for uh, uh, job seekers. and I thought we were talking about that. Well, let, let's review the bidding and make sure we have misunderstood. <laughs> um, I said I think it's a matter of constitutional principle that the beneficiaries of ah, these programs, okay. the recipients of the services, have a secular alternative yeah, available okay. so that they're not forced into a religious provider against their will. With respect to employment... It's a different I, question. I don't think they are guaranteed... Um, a federally funded secular employer of their choice. I think as a practical matter, if we award the grants and the contracts on the basis of merit, there will be a diversity of federally funded private sector employers out there. But, but I don't think that, I don't think that job seekers get guarantees in the way that the beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My time has long expired. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, I now recognize the, uh, um, the chairman of the full committee. Oh, um, Chairman Defers, I recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Scott. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, one of the things that um, is confusing me on this uh, secular alternative 
is what is going on in the program that requires an alternative? Devin Lynn? I think uh, that's an excellent point. One of the things that I disagree about in regard to the executive order yesterday was the determination that uh, religious icons and symbols do not need to be removed from the wall. On the other hand, uh, on a wall where the a federally funded service is being provided, I just find it unusual that you cannot, under the re regulations, presumably to be promulgated after the executive order, that you cannot use these government funds to proselytize or to evangelize, but it's perfectly acceptable to have them occur, whether that's a counseling session or a, a hunger program, in a place that contains the very symbols, icons, and statements of the faith. I mean, what could be more of an evangelistic opportunity than to put up a quote from the Christian Bible suggesting that Jesus is the only way to salvation and to have that appear on the walls of a federally subsidized program of any kind. I think that's a, a fundamental problem. If you have a person who does not want to have a religious provider, then it seems uh, to me that uh, you must guarantee and there has to be but a wait, wait a minute. If the, if, if the provider happens to be of a certain religion, and the beneficiary just doesn't like that religion, and it is a secular program, can you say, well, I don't like that provider's religion. I want an altar. I want somebody. I don't want somebody of that faith counseling me on, on my drug problem. I want somebody of another faith. Is that a legitimate complaint? I think it is a legitimate complaint, and I think it's even more legitimate. I mean, this doesn't have anything to do with faith base. I just don't like the man's religion. Well, but I think that's a secular program, right? Yeah, but the, the beneficiary may well understand, particularly if he or she is in a room. Well, you're, you're talking about it with faith. I mean, you, if it is a secular program and it's run as a secular program and you just don't happen to like, you just find out the guy's religion is one you don't agree with, I want someone of another religion. I mean, it used to be a time in hospitals, uh, you know, I, I don't want a doctor of that race. Um, you know, what um, I mean is this: if it is a secular program, run appropriately, Professor Laycock. If you got a secular program, run appropriately without the proselytizing. What is the complaint? Well, if you wholly secularize the religious providers, then I think there. No, no, no the program, not the provider. I, I mean, people have people will come in with their religion. Do you have a program that is a secular program? And if, if you're suggesting that the things are going on that are actually proselytizing, then you've then, then you got another problem. Well, not just the alternative. You've you've got another problem. Yeah, I, yeah, as as I understood this, the idea for these programs back in the beginning, and there's been some substantial evolution since 1996. But as 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 I understood the the point back in 1996. Um, the, the, the program had to provide the secular service that the government was willing to pay for and had to provide it. Well, let me tell you, back in 1976, the, 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 the bill, the original bill, allowed the program to require as a condition of participation that you take communion and come to Wednesday night prayer sessions. But you got that fixed before it was enacted. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah that's right. Get, and we think get, we got it fixed so that there's fixed, no proselytization. But, and, but what it said was government funds cannot be used to pay for proselytization. Okay. And... And, and one, way, w w one form of implementation that would have been consistent with that 1996 legislation would have been to say, the second part of the program is paid for with government money, religious add-ons to the program are paid on with, paid for with religious oh, well, no, money, no, 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 and no. they don't have to be cleanly separated. Uh, well, right? no, yes, they do. Well, well when the, we passed the, legislation under this committee, it did have to be cleanly separated so that you could participate in the government-funded program without any proselytizing, added on, because the, the, as a matter of fact, the, 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 the concern was uh, the original bill said paid for with government money, which opened the opportunity for the youth uh, choir director to come in and volunteer, to come in and lead the group in praise and prayer. That was, a, we, we made sure that that was not possible. The program had to be secular. And, and I understand that. There's, we've, in, in, in the intervening years, we've added the separation requirement that any religious add-ons have to be separate in time or separate in space. 
Um, that may well have been a mistake, but that's what we've done. Excuse me, that add-on may have been a mistake or the original may have been a mistake? The, the, the requirement of separation may have been a mistake, but that's the direction we've gone in, and that does reduce the need for the secular alternative. I don't think it eliminates it. Uh, if, if, if we can still have religious art on the walls, and I don't think we should take it down, uh, then you can, the beneficiaries can have a reasonable religious objection to that. They, they can still be uh, invited to the separate program that's going to occur later in the day, and they may not w want to deal with that. But, but, but you're right. The more we secularize the, the program, the less so your, your assumption it is that your assumption program. is that uh, there's still some proselytization going on in some of these programs for which you need an alternative. I'm, well, th there may be some proselytization going well, on. Let me, let me, let me get we'll another question be because uh, let me get another question. Uh, Reverend Lynn, you mentioned um, uh, Dr. York, a psychologist who couldn't get a job at a program because of his religion. Um, it's my understanding that the faith-based office is treating discrimination cases on what they call a case-by-case -case basis, whatever that means. Um, can you explain how, a pro if there's only one drug counseling program in the area, it's run by faith-based organizations discriminating, how does Dr. York get a job as a drug counselor anywhere in the county? Or, oh, is he, uh, or does his religion essentially eliminate any possibility uh, of employment in a drug program? I think the answer is that he is unlikely to find any job in that county. Because if, of his religion? Because of his religion. And uh, this, this could be a countywide phenomenon or in entire states one could imagine a condition where he could not find a reasonable job if those would-be employers, including the religiously based ones, are allowed to discriminate on the basis of religion. As far as the case-by-case -case review, I, we have repeatedly asked the administration, the Justice Department, to explain what this case-by-case -case review is. But a case-by-case -case review that results in permitting discrimination in some cases but not others, if that's happening, we have no standards, there are no written documents, there are no rules about how this is being applied. I don't think you can have a case-by-case -case evaluation if some cases lead to saying no on the basis of religion to that job seeker. And Mr. Chairman, if I can just get one thing on the record from Ms. Rod Professor Rogers. That, uh, the, prior to 2001, or late 2001, the, the Bush executive order, which changed the Johnson executive order, that constituted a change. Is it true that before then, if you get a federal contract, you could not discriminate based on religion? Yes, that was the 1965 Lyndon B. Johnson executive order that related to contracts and was amended by the Bush 2002 executive order. Now, in 2000, after 2002, if a faith-based organization is running a program, what legal prohibition is there against discriminating openly and notoriously on the basis of a person's religion? Well, for that, you would have to look at the program at issue because there are different statutes. For example, a terrible choice statute would allow that. Um, if, there's, if there's no specific prohibition against discrimination in the program. There's no overarching uh, prohibition against discrimination. In some programs, there are conditions that are like the one that was at issue in the World Vision uh, case where the Justice Department issued a memo. There was a non-discrimination uh, provision that related to employment in that particular program. But other programs contain charitable choice provisions that would allow the discrimination, and so we have... Or, they're, have si any, or they're silent. Or they're silent, yes. And they're in that case, a, a program can have a practice of discriminating against persons in employment solely based on religion. Yes, and in those cases where it's you know, the, there's a charitable choice statute, for example, they could. Or, or if there's no specific prohibition. Well, I suppose that, uh, that you would have to take a look at regulations and see what's there, but it's conceivable that that might be the case. And so a person applying for a job paid for with federal money can be told, we don't hire people of your faith, just like uh, Mr. York was told, that <laughs> would be legal in those programs. If it was a religious group and they had the clearance, the charitable choice type language, then they would be able to make those decisions on the basis of religion with regard to a federally funded job. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The, uh, I now yield uh, five minutes to the gentleman from uh, Arizona. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think one of the challenges that we have in, in a situation like this is that there are organizations out there that seem genuinely committed to trying to erase any sort of, re of uh, religious expression from American life. And, and I'm, I, I'm not going to try to make that case here this morning, but I believe it's part of the issue. Uh, I wrote a bill here about 15 years ago that passed in the Arizona legislature that simply allowed people, private individuals on a voluntary basis, to contribute to a scholarship fund for children to go to school of their parents' choice. And that's private dollars that never touch the public coffers whatsoever. And um, the, the rub came in when some of those parents chose a religious school for their child. And of course, the ACL, you know, Mr. Lynn and others, uh, sued us in the federal courts for the last 15 years, last 12 years. And uh, oral arguments were heard in the U.S. Supreme Court here about two, two and a half weeks ago. And I think the Supreme Court will, up, would, will uphold the Arizona uh, provision because otherwise they would be saying that every dollar in everyone's pocket is public money. That's exactly what the ACLU is arguing, that that's public money simply because uh, it's subject to a tax credit. I'm wondering how long it will be before the ACLU argues that money given to a church because there's special tax treatment involved there that is deductible, that that money is also public money and that the church, if you're uh, uh, a Jewish synagogue, that you have to hire uh, a Baptist uh, uh, to, to uh, be your counselor for young marrieds. Uh, I mean, it just the, the possibilities are endless. And as we all know by now that uh, yesterday, President Obama issued a new executive order dealing with the White, Office, the White House Office Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. But it was silent as to the degree to which you, religious entities in, could continue to enjoy the freedom of association through hiring. Now, the order's lack of clarity has breathed a new life into what was once an otherwise long settled questions of whether grant recipients can hire and fire based on religious association. For 50 years, our courts have said yes, but our current administration officials have said that those questions will be answered on an ad hoc basis. Boy, that's, uh, I don't know how a religious entity can possibly know what is permissible and what is not permissible under the administration's ad hoc approach. I mean, Ad hoc is sort of synonymous with, with making it up as you go. And I think this violates the basic notions of due process. I mean, King George was famous for his ad hoc approach to almost everything. Um, so I guess, uh, Mr. Laycock, my first question here before I get too exercised is, is the administration's ad hoc policy a clear victory for those, if there are such groups, uh, that would seek to deny religious entities the right to associate with or employ only those who share their religious beliefs. I mean, do you think that's a victory for those groups that want to remove that, uh, that, that liberty to religious groups? No, I think it's postponing the issue. I mean, none of the three witnesses like case by case or ad hoc, right? The, Professor Rogers and Reverend Lynn would say you can never hire on a basis of religion if you have a federal grant, and, and, and I, would, I would say you can. Um, th there's some room for case by case. Um, there, there may be some jobs. Um, where, uh, you know, whether it's a sincerity issue or it doesn't really look like a burden, but I think most of uh, most of the three of us believe, all three of us believe that in most cases there's a clear rule one way or the other, and 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 the administration's case by case approach uh, seems to be a way of not having to make that hard choice. Yeah, well, obviously I couldn't agree with you more, and it frightens me to death that there's a consensus on this point, but I'm grateful. Um, I guess my last thought, Mr. Chairman, is that uh, this is a pretty important area that we're dealing with, and uh, it's my judgment that the ability to have a private donor intervene in the protocol here is the best approach. In other words, allowing individuals to give to these things and then get an even more powerful uh, tax uh, uh, advantage than just deduction, because this takes these burdens off of government and puts them in a in a situation where private individuals can uh, vet, vet these groups much better than government seems to. And uh, I think that it kind of builds a firewall here that uh, would probably make both sides a lot happier. Now, it depends on how the Supreme Court comes down on this case uh, from Arizona. Um, but I think that might be something. I don't know. You know, I, 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 deigned, I, I, I don't know if I dare think that the ACLU would be happy with that since they're suing us in federal court right now on it. 
But uh, I think that we have to do something like this because otherwise uh, we're going to say that, you know, any anything that is within the shadow of the American flag can't be religious. And uh, I think that that would uh, undermine everything that the country, at least uh, the, the ideals that, uh, that catalyzed it in the first place. My last thought then, uh, uh, Mr. Laycock, don't you think that if this ad hoc approach um, happens that there are going to be a, a lot of litigation and arguments over it because of the lack of clarity? And how will the cost of litigation be borne? Um, and and uh, would the, those principles be would, they, would someone forbear on those principles until it was decided in court? And wouldn't this be a pretty serious chill on the basic freedom of association for religious entities that couldn't find the financial ability to fight the Obama administration to protect their rights? Well, the litigation would most commonly come in the form of an employee suing a religious agency uh, for not hiring him or not promoting him. There, and, and if the employee wins, the agency has to pay the uh, employees' attorney's fees. There's been remarkably little of that litigation. Uh, folks who don't get hired tend to go on to the next job and not to file lawsuits, so that most employment discrimination litigation is about promotions and discharges uh, or pay rather than about hiring. So, so far, the litigation burden has not been, has, has not been bad. Well, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, I think that's, that's great, but I think that the ad hoc uh, rule of the administration is an open invitation for everybody just to sue because it's Friday. And uh, so with that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I now recognize the uh, gentleman from North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, um, I think Mr. Franks and I have found some common ground here, um, maybe not in the consequences of, um, uh, of uh, what this rule will lead to. Um, our concern is that it will lead people to groups to uh, to discriminate um, and take their chances because, um, as has been indicated, seldom do even uh, the people file lawsuits. They, in most cases, don't even know they've been discriminated against. Um, they don't find out. They're, they're, it's not articulated as as clearly as the case that uh, Reverend Lynn described. So. Uh, um, I, I'm, I'm with you on that. Uh, I think all three witnesses seem to be with you on that. Um, it seems to be uh, delaying a very difficult choice uh, for the administration. Um, and I want to come back to that. But um, first of all, I want to welcome Professor Rogers. Uh, not that I don't welcome the other two uh, <laughs> gentlemen also, but uh, uh, Professor Rogers uh, is from Wake Forest University. Divinity School and uh, at least a part of Wake Forest University is in my congressional district. Uh, not all of it. Uh, I'm not sure where the Divinity School is located, so I, I'm not sure whether you're in my district or not in my district, but uh, all, since all politics is local, I want to make sure I welcome uh, either my constituent or my near constituent. Uh, <laughs> Uh, um, well, thank you. I can solve this because I actually live in Falls Church, Virginia, but teach classes that meet in Washington and in North Carolina. So, so hey, <laughs> uh, she's not my constituent. I take back my, my I special. Appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate your welcome nonetheless, and we'll bring take it back, back my to my special mind. welcome. Oh. Welcome all three of you uh, on an equal footing in that case. Uh, <laughs> but I do appreciate you uh, extending your wisdom to uh, Wake Forest, and I'm sure the folks at Wake Forest University appreciate it. Um, and come back to this issue because uh, Professor Laycock um, actually said the administration seems to be avoiding a difficult uh, decision. Um, it went out of its way apparently to take this issue of employment out of the jurisdiction of the commission that was set up. Um, um, Professor Rogers, uh, you were on that commission. Um, um, Am I missing something here? I mean, what, what's, what's up with the administration delaying a difficult uh, decision? I mean, either, um, either you can discriminate or you can't discriminate. Um, and I don't know uh, that uh, allowing it to happen on a case-by-case -case basis or evaluating it on a case-by-case -case basis. I'm with Mr. Franks on that. Uh, 
What was the rationale for taking that part of uh, this from the commission's portfolio? Well, there wasn't a lot of discussion about it, but um, from the administration uh, to us. But the they uh, were aware, of course, of you know a lot of uh, law in this area and felt that it was important for them to make this. Okay. Well, call now this administration been in power now for two years. Uh, is there any indication of when they will make this decision? I'm, uh, you yes, know, I'm I have no information on that. Okay, no All more right. than you do. I will say that people on the on the council, there were some of us who really wanted to address this issue within the context of the council. There were other council members who didn't want to, and some in between. Um, so there were different feelings about that, but the administration decided it would handle it through this separate process, and I don't have more. What is the separate process? I, I have no information. Does anybody on this panel know what the separate process is? Now we, uh, along with 57 other groups, have written to the Attorney General, have followed up on this question of wh when this policy will be discussed, when this Office of Legal Opinion memorandum will re be reviewed and, I hope, repealed. Uh, and we have had uh, no luck whatsoever in moving them forward toward an answer, much less a change in the policy. And it's deeply disappointing. Um, okay. Well, um, uh, Representative uh, Watt, I would just yes. want to say that, um, if I may, that issue is very important um, in my mind and obviously in yours as well. I do believe, though, that the, the executive order and, and the recommendations that the council did make on a range of other issues are very important. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm not dim, um, diminishing the value of, uh, of the commission's work. I didn't I'm think just, you were, but um, I just wanted to uh, raise yeah. those again because that, that was quite a bit of work and kept us very busy um, and was something that we feel very strongly about these other issues. Now, the council itself, the membership of the council, would divide on the employment issue. Now, am I, am I clear, Professor Laycock, that um, um, you are in a different position on how that issue ought to be resolved from the other two members of this panel? Yes, sir. Uh, you believe that, um, that um, uh, using government money um, a religious institution should be able to discriminate uh, based on religion. Yes. You know, I, I believe we should not use the government money to force the religious organization to change its... So if, um, if, the, if the objective of uh, an after-school program is to um, get uh, kids uh, to perform better and um, there are two applicants, one of whom is clearly superior to um, in achieving that objective, a, a teacher, long experience uh, in achieving that objective. The other one uh, has no experience but happens to be uh, a member of the particular faith you think is fine uh, for that employer to select the person based on that person's faith. Well, in that example, it probably isn't. Recall the well. I, I, you know, either uh, we we got a black or white rule here. Uh, that's that's what we all of us have been advocating but for, for a rule. Uh, more Mr. than one Trent rule. And I agree. We need a rule. You can't have it both ways. You can either discriminate or you can't discriminate. You can discriminate, but the you said you said you I believe that they ought to be able to discriminate. The organization also has to win the grant on the merits. It has to be the best at delivering the services. And if it's hiring unqualified people, it's not likely to uh, win many grants. So the realistic comparison that we're talking about for groups so of you would take a um, take two relatively qualified people, one of whom also supports the mission and, and, and well, uh, let's let's the change the equation. Make sure that uh, <laughs> that is that is clear. Uh, this person has no qualifications, um, uh, but happens to be a Baptist or and this is a Baptist program, Baptist-run program, um, you, you think uh, the using federal dollars, we ought to uh, 
we ought to support um, uh, allowing them to use federal dollars for that purpose. Yes, but only so long as they are the best at providing the service. And in your hypothetical doesn't exist in the real world. Okay. They're not going to be the best. All right, at I, I'm not. Yeah, that's not a trick question. I'm just uh, I just trying to trying to be clear uh, on uh, um, either one of the other two witnesses agree with that. Uh, I, I certainly don't agree with okay, that. Okay, I, I, I think I got that from your testimony. Yeah. What about you, Ms. Rogers? <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, you, you, you equivocated a little bit more than, than Reverend <laughs> Lynn did. Uh, what about you, Professor Rogers? Yes, I, I disagree. I believe that when it is involving private money, the religious organization's own money given by tithes and gifts of the people that subscribe to that faith, then there should be full freedom to make religion dis, religious dis calls on who is hired. Um, of course, Baptist churches should be able to help Baptist preachers, as I said at the outset. But the money, uh, direct government aid, that changes the calculus. Okay. All right. Uh, again, um, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm just trying to make sure we, we get the record uh, Right. Clear. And I would say that also that uh, positions, uh, an organization, a religious organization could receive a government grant. And uh, I think it should not be able to make religious calls on the positions that are subsidized by that grant money, but at positions that are outside that are privately funded, then they should be able to d make religious calls on those positions, even well, though they're I, still getting a government grant. I, I just wanted I, I to I don't know how you're going to do that, but uh, I, I mean, um, I, money is fungible, and unless you set up two separate organizations, I don't think you can do that. But, uh, you know, again, this is not... not intended to create a, a, a overarching debate. I'm just trying to get the, this specific principle and where these three witnesses um, uh, uh, come out on this. And so my time has long since expired. So I'll if, if I may add, sir, very brief, it's also fairly common to have employees who are paid 50% on the grant and 50% with other funds. Uh, so you'd allow them to discriminate 50% of the time or? I, 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 I'd, I'd allow them to hire people who support their mission and preserve their religious identity. Um, you sound as wishy-washy as the administration on this. No, I'm, uh, I'm not. I, I would allow them to hire. You call that discrimination. I call that. That's what religious organizations do. Yeah. Well, I, I agree. They do. Uh, and I actually sanctioned them doing it uh, with their own money. I just don't can't sanction them doing it with taxpayer money. Yet. Uh, so that's, that's the divide. I mean, I, we're, we're not... We're all adults here. I yield back. Thank you. I, I just observed that uh, with what Professor Laycock just said, then you have not the 50-50 situations, but the lounge situation, for instance, where 900, 950 employees were paid 95 percent with federal money and 5 percent with non-federal money, which perhaps presents a different aspect of the case. Uh, that concludes our... Oh, oh think so. I'm sorry. I didn't... The, uh, gentleman, the uh, chairman of the full committee. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I wanted to ask uh, Chairman Bobby Scott if he had a, a, an observation that he wanted to weigh in on before I began. Um, do we have a definition? Is there somewhere where there's a definition of what faith-based means? I mean, you kind of know it when you see it, if it's a church um, but um, if you just have a bunch of people who declare themselves to be religious, are they exempt from civil rights laws under this theory? Uh, as I, in general, if one declares oneself to be a church, for example, you are presumed to be a charitable 501c3 organization, and many churches never strictly apply for that. They're simply well, I mean, for the, pur for the purpose of this, of this law, if a bunch of us get together, happen to be the same religion, can we declare ourselves um, a religious organization and therefore exempt because we just feel so strongly, with you, we just don't want to hire people to that religion? I think that's perfectly permissible under the rules that are still in effect from the last administration unchanged by this one. Okay. Uh, the other question is, uh, can you tell, just for the record, what is the law, present law, on direct contracting with uh, religious organizations and how that differs in this context with a voucher situation? Can the federal government contract 
with a church to provide services. And has that always been the case, or has it then been an evolving standard? And does uh, the fact that it's a voucher where the beneficiary is actually making the choice make a difference in the proselytization that's going on in what is, would essentially be a federally funded, or at least partially federally funded program? Um, Congressman Scott, that was one issue that we asked in the executive order, we asked the administration to opine on because we couldn't agree in the advisory council about that. Some in the advisory council would cite the school voucher decision, the Zellman decision from 2002 that upheld uh, the fact that there can be some programs that include religious schools in them that where people can use the voucher at the religious school. But the choice is the parents, it's not the state. Right, that that breaks the circuit in the Supreme Court's view between the connection between church and state and thus makes it permissible in their view. Some, some believe that that decision applies and makes it so that you could take a social service voucher um, to a drug rehabilitation program and allow that program could include, uh, you know, part of the part of the way you get off drugs is to accept our ideas about Jesus Christ and what he can mean for your life. And that's with a voucher, but can you have a direct funding of a religious organization directly? With that type of content, you could not. Um, now, let, let me say that some of us would disagree with that, with that reading or at least question the, the indirect uh, application in the social service voucher context, that there might be some differences between the school voucher context and the social service voucher context. Um, when it comes to direct aid, what we've said, what the administration has said in the executive order and what we said in our recommendations was that programs that are funded by direct aid cannot have religious content. That is, they cannot in include worship, prayer, religious instruction, any or, of that. Or, or anything that would provoke someone from wanting an alternative service? Well, that your question earlier, I think that uh, we it is clear clear in the executive order that that program that's funded by direct aid has to be free of explicit religious content. But a, a beneficiary might feel that if they, they don't want to enter a church for some religious reason or perhaps for a non, you know, they just object to having to go to a church or to go into a room or go into a building that has religious symbols and the like. So we wanted to make sure that we provided um, that notice of that right for that kind of person, even if there isn't religious content in the direct, the programs that's funded by direct aid, that they would have a secular alternative if they want one. Thank you. Uh, I am I'm so sorry that my colleague from Arizona isn't with us, Trent Franks, but you'll, of course, hear about this. But uh, his claim that uh, that for 50 years the courts have said religious organizations can discriminate in employment based on religion uh, stands a little bit closer scrutiny. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the only way that could possibly uh, uh, apply is to privately funded uh, religious activities, but that does not apply when you're talking about taxpayer-funded activities. Um, do you agree, uh, Reverend Lynn? I certainly do. I have no idea what cases you could cite over a 50-year period that reached the conclusion that uh, Congressman Franks has reached. And uh, in fact, there's very little uh, hard black letter law on this matter, very few cases. There's certainly not 50 years in the direction that uh, Mr. Franks has discussed. It simply is yeah. not there. And, and I wanted to uh, welcome you. I noticed uh, my colleague, Mr. Watt, welcome Professor Rogers. I, I'd like to welcome you only. Uh, the law school you went to isn't anywhere remotely near my congressional <laughs> district, but I do it anyway. I appreciate that. I, I've, I've spoken at law schools in your district. <laughs> oh, that's pretty close. Okay. Um, 
Do you agree with this discussion, Ms. Rogers? Yeah, I don't know what his citation to a 50-year precedent. I, I'm sorry he's not here to answer that question. Um, uh, I don't know what he was referring to. I think we do have this long tradition that many of you have referenced, um, s starting, I think, with FDR in, in the 1940s about equal opportunity in government-funded and federally-funded employment. And that's a precedent that has been long standing that I'm quite familiar with, but I, I so I, I, I don't understand the reference that he made. And, and Professor Laycock, may I be bold enough to solicit your agreement sure. in this I, discussion? I assume he must have been referring to the 702 exemption in Title VII, but uh, as all three witnesses have said, you know, it's, the whole point of dispute is whether that applies when the position is government funded in whole or in part, and that certainly is not settled. There are very few cases that go both ways. Um, with respect to the executive order, which has now been amended, um, even when, when the executive order said no discrimination based on religion, there would have been a question about the priority of the statute and of the executive order and which was more specific as applied to this issue. So I, I, I think it's unsettled, but he must have been thinking about the exemption in Title Seven. Let's give him the benefit of the doubt. I'll I'll, I'll see him later on today, or <coughs> not later than Monday anyway, and we'll continue this discussion. Uh, now I I come to uh, one of your positions, Professor Laycock, that I would like to put under the microscope for a little more scrutiny. Um, and again, I, I'll start with uh, Reverend Attorney Lynn. And uh, ask, is, is there, uh, is, isn't there some restriction that privately funded religious activities uh, be separated from government funded secular services? Is there some policy that that uh, that makes that a pretty standard practice, or as Professor Laycock asserts, it, it doesn't matter whether it's government funded or not? I think it makes all the difference in the world. And in fact, in the Civil Rights Act, as amended in 1972, if you look at the record in this body and in the Senate. There is discussion about how organizations ought to be able to hire, and they, they consistently refer to private dollars. Senator Irvin, who is cited in, in Professor Rogers' testimony, uh, said that. He said that all the time, including on the floor. No one seriously pro was proposing in 1972 that with federal dollars comes an exemption from the otherwise applicable civil rights principles of the country. It simply is not there. Professor Rogers, can you weigh in on this before yeah, I turn to it's an article that I wrote in and in preparation for writing it, I looked back at the nineteen seventy two history and found that uh, the prime co sponsors and this includes uh, Sam Irvin, when he was making the case for the broadening of the seven oh two exemption he would cite to institutions which he emphasized were supported solely by private money um, to make the case for that broadening of the exemption that happened in 1972. And also Senator Allen did, made similar types of statements, citing that as, as part of his case for broadening the exemption. So there, if you're interested in that, there's, a, there's more about that in the article that I wrote a few years ago. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can I have enough time to have Professor Laycock. Without objection. Uh, Professor Laycock, you've been outvoted, but that doesn't mean anything around here. <laughs> uh, what say you? Well, if, if I understood your question, you're, you initially asked about the requirement that the, any religious part of a program that's privately funded be separated in time and space from any secular part, and that is required by the executive order, is required by regulations that were in place before yesterday. Um, and 
it seems to be settled about these programs i suggest in my written testimony it may not be constitutionally required but it's certainly required by by regulation you know the current state of the law as on the hiring issue i think is simply up in the air you've got whatever whatever people said in the legislative history you've got a clear exemption in the statutory text of title seven the bush people amended the sixty zero executive order the new executive order from the obama people doesn't address it the cases go both ways so the hiring issue i don't think there's any clear law in place well we we made far more progress than i had expected i'm happy to hear you agree that uh... uh... funding private money and and government money uh, should generally be separated in time and location. Yes, and one of the interesting things, um, Chairman Conyers, is that people who disagree about the employment issue on the council were able to come together and all of us agreed that as to religious activities that were privately funded, those should be cleanly sep and carefully separated from a program funded by direct government aid. So even those who have differences over the employment issue on the council were able to come together on that uh, point. And that's a very important point because as we were discussing earlier, uh, some earlier statutes uh, did not make this as clear as it should be. Mm -hmm. So I'm very pleased that the council recommendation that does, I hope, drive the point home uh, was uh, made a part of the executive order and that there's a very high degree of consensus on those issues at the present time. Well, that, that's encouraging. Do you feel any better about that, Professor Laycock? I think that's a done deal. I mean, the, I think the, the executive and Congress have come to agreement on that. Um, and you. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure we needed to go that way, but we've gone that way. <laughs> All right, reluctance doesn't change. It's, it's like the way we vote sometimes here. Uh, you hold your nose and vote that way. You, it's reluctant. I mean, it's, it's not with enthusiasm. So you, you remind me of the way some of our colleagues, including myself, have to vote sometimes. Chairman Conyers, another point I would make about that as a religious person, I'm pleased that, that that requirement is there because I don't want government meddling in religion. I don't want it to tell a religious organization what they can and can't say about religion, about matters of faith. So if the religious activities are privately funded and cleanly separated from the government program, then the religious organization is in charge of that. And as long as all the other things are observed, then that keeps the government out of meddling in the religious sphere. And I definitely, as a religious person myself, do not want the government meddling in the religious sphere. Thank you, Chairman Nether. Thank you, the gentleman from Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, do the panelists uh, agree or disagree that uh, a person a citizen in a, uh, the United States uh, has a right to be free from religion. They have is is okay. there a right to be free from religion? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I would put it differently. I would put it, um, they're f they have a right to be free from government establishments of religion. Um, and so they, they should be free not to have the government pressure them in any way on religious matters, but they're not free from just encountering religion in the public square uh, where religion plays such a robust role, and I think that's appropriate. We don't want the government playing that role. We want it to ensure that it does not pressure people along religious lines. That's an inappropriate role for government. I would just take one step further and suggest, Congressman Johnson, that one thing that people who do not choose to be religious also have a right to expect is that their tax dollars will not be subsidizing the religion of other people, any of them or all of them. I think yeah. that is a core principle as well. Um, excuse me. We're going to have to. There is a, uh, an immediate uh, vote in the Democratic caucus, so we're going to have to recess the hearing, not for too long, I hope. This hearing. Mr. Chairman. I, I apologize, but I have a flight, and I'm going to have to leave at this recess. Well, that's, that's, then let me thank you for your attendance here, be, well, which I was going to do later. Well, going to another university to explain why the government shouldn't put up crosses. 
Well, uh, if, if I might, Mr. Chairman, uh, we were just getting ready to get into some uh, well, good discussion. This is not a 15 yeah, but, but I'm, I'm, only thing I want to say is uh, I know that uh, the witnesses have been here uh, this morning, and I appreciate you being here. Look forward to holding, uh, hosting you again to answer some of the questions that uh, that I have. But I'm, I, I will uh, yield and uh, let the well, hearing be uh, brought. I appreciate to the, the gentleman's meeting. actions. Let me Sir, say I'd that I'd be happy to answer in writing if you had a question you wanted we'll, to ask and didn't get a chance to. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll conclude the hearing then. But before we conclude, I just want to claim a. Uh, claim a point of personal privilege. This, is, this may be the subcommittee's last meeting of this Congress. It's been an honor to have been able to serve as the chair. Our jurisdiction gives us the responsibility of protecting the fundamental rights of this country. I want to thank the members of the subcommittee, especially our distinguished ranking member, the gentleman from Wisconsin, for their hard work and for the dedication they've always brought to this task. I want to thank the committee staff, the subcommittee staff. Most people never know just how hard they work behind the scenes, how dedicated they are how talented each of them is. I want to thank our counsels, Heather Sawyer, Keenan Keller, Kanye Bennett, Democratic side, Paul Taylor, and the Republican side, Matthew Morgan, our clerk, without whom the subcommittee could not function, and our chief of staff, David Lackman. Many more people have also contributed to our work over the years. Too many to mention, but we all, my, I and my colleagues, genuinely appreciate that's their service. And uh, the usual boilerplate language, all members left five legislative days to submit to the chair additional questions. We ask that um, witnesses to respond as promptly as they can. That objection, all members of five legislative days submit any additional materials for inclusion in the record. Again, I thank everyone. I thank our witnesses. I thank the staff. I thank the members. With that, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.